Our next speaker is Paul Walk. Paul received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Georgia Tech, a master's in mechanical engineering from the University of South Carolina, and is currently a PhD candidate in systems engineering at Virginia Tech. His research interests include the theoretical foundation for engineering systems and systems science. Paul has recently been leading enterprise digital engineering transformation with the Aerospace, Aerospace Corporation. His prior work experience is with the Department of Energy, two national laboratories, and the medical industry. Paul will be presenting his research, Leveraging Systems Theory to Achieve Ver Verification Agility. Paul, over to you. All right, thank you. So uh, I'm at, uh, working on my PhD at Virginia Tech. I have two advisors right now, both Peter Beeling and Alejandro Salado. And I've been working on systems theory. It's actually really good to have their advisement because they're both being different perspectives. And I, I've realized that there's some power that we can bring to systems theory or from systems theory into the paradigms that are kind of evolving right in front of us. And what I believe is that those are gonna enable verification agility, which is something we're seeking as part of this evolution to this new paradigm. But I want to start before I actually go into some of the why and the story behind it. I want to start really at the end and just ask some some framing questions. And the first one is just how do we actually know that an asset that we use for verification is a valid representation of a system design? And this question is is really important, especially with the involved in evolving. Uh, complexity of systems today, where we're always going to have to rely on abstractions of the design to understand the system. And so just on one extreme example of uh, a pa possible representation is, do we know that the design that's produced at the end product is a valid representation? Well, yes, I mean, it should be. And what about on the other end of the spectrum? What about a mass mock representation? Is that a valid representation of the design? Probably within a certain context. But what about something that's just a partial functionality? Do we actually know if those are valid rep representation of the design? And my research and what I've found in systems theory is this concept of a morphism, which we can use to mathematically characterize the validity of an abstraction and, a, and an elaboration compared to each other. Can I go, go back though, and really to explain some of the story for why this is a, a critical part in, in the critical research area. You have to understand this evolution that we're going through right now. And essentially, we are still actually largely within a document-based paradigm, even though we all believe that MBSC is, is the greatest things, we're still in, in a document-based. And that's kind of despite existence of these model-based engineering methodologies that have existed since the early 90s. And this is actually, it's, it's awesome though, because MBSC is effectively becoming a core mechanism to enable this digital transformation. It's something that I've seen both from review, extensive review of the literature, and it's something that I, a conclusion that I've come to even from practice and seeing what's actually being implemented and the power that's enabled through MBSE. And as a systems engineer, that's awesome. But, you know, there are some caveats there that, that we need to really understand is that current MBSE is really, it's, it's descriptive. It's not something that has iner inherent analytical or, uh, or computational capabilities. And that's contrary to what other engineering domains have done. So an example would be like P-SPICE for electrical engineering, where each of the elements have a precise definition and a precise mathematical representation that we can understand in the greater context of the whole. And in fact, we can even use the concepts to have to compare equivalent systems. And in other cases, which is more in line with my previous life as a mechanical engineer, uh, we use things like computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis to actually understand uh, 
the models that were, were um, understand the meaning and perform computation on the models that we have. This is just unfortunately not something that we have right now with, with MBSE. And what I'm saying is that we need some sort of theoretical capability for MBSE. And going back to, to this image where, you know, everything, yeah, it's leading to this digital transformation. And what I've actually decided to explore for my research path is Weimarian systems theory. So Weimar wrote his, his book back in 1967 on the mathematical theory of systems engineering. And even wrote a, a more recent book that coined the term model-based systems engineering. And it seems that there's some influence on SysML, but it's it's not very clear how that's tied. In fact, some of my past research, I actually looked at if I can take Wymore's uh, theory of model-based systems engineering and underpin it to SysML. But I realized that I need to take a step back and look at it and say, what is this actually theory that, that we have available to us? And what can I take from that? And what can we convert to practice? So effectively, what I'm saying is I'm not going to pick a language right now. I, I just I don't think that's necessarily the right answer. I just want to look at it and eventually, yeah, it'll get to some some merger between this descriptive and analytical capabilities. But right now I'm at the point of saying, like, I'm going to grab some part of, of Weimarian systems theory and, and provide that bridge from theory to practice. So rather than just take the whole theory, even I, I even I can't do that. I need to look at it from just an isolating context. And what I've decided is that verification is is a prime candidate for need of theoretical foundations. And in one aspect, there's there's one article that Paul Colopy highlighted pretty well uh, on verification is that with the evolving systems and the increasing complexity, we can't test everything. So we have to rely on valid ab abstractions. We can't rely on the same methods that we used before. We need to understand these relationships of between abstraction and elaboration. And in fact, even the calls for the digital transformation, they say that we believe we're gonna improve verification. Awesome. And we're also gonna add agility, by the way. So I'd like to take take MBOC and uh, uh, give it some, some power of systems theory uh, in the form of a, a morphism that I'm going to apply for verification. Before we can actually understand verification, though, it's really important to go back to requirements because verification is confirmation of adherence to system requirements. And within the context of systems theory, the definition of a system is actually very clear. And that's that a system is defined as a transformation of inputs into outputs which means that system requirements are effectively required transformations of inputs into outputs. So this kind of brings into my, my hypotheses that, are, that I'm working toward. And the first one is that, okay, if we're gonna categorize systems as input-output transformations, and we're gonna categorize requirements as required input-output transformations, and we should also be defining verification requirements as input output transformations. And subsequently from there, we can define our verification assets and those should be defined on the basis of a mathematical relationship to the design. And ultimately my hypothesis, and this is a bit of a mouthful, is, is I'm, I'm saying that if we mathematically define our systems uh, mathematically on the basis of mathematically specified requirements, then that should lead to verification agility. So going back to Wymore's theory, in case you, you actually don't want to or don't have the time to read like this like dense book right here, I've, I've abstracted it into this systems engineering V to show you some of the power that I'm extracting from this theory. And essentially what Wymore did is he, he defined uh, two problem, some problem space or spaces. The first one is the problem space of functions, which actually defines and bounds the functional system design. Wymore defined it another space, which is 
bound by available technology and resources, which is used to capture what components you can actually you can actually implement within the design and couple. And based on that coupling of the components, that results in a buildable design. Now, now the actual implementation is is based on a a buildable design, and which is then tested. However, you really need this this relationship here in the middle, which is a morphism that defines the relationship between the potentially more abstract functional design and the potentially more elaborate buildable design. And that's something that when I when I started thinking about it more and more, it's like, wow, we we can we can capitalize on this concept of amorphism. And we can bring that within the context of, of modern systems engineering and enable this computational capability that we're seeking with the digital transformation. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit further on, on Wymore's theory and, and some of the power that, that I've taken away from it, is that I, I took this image and I, and I more or less created it based on Wymore's MBSC book. And what he did is he, he used the concept of amorphism to mathematically relate a software system to a hardware system to a functional system design. And what he's saying there is that the software system is the more elaborate, uh, followed by a slightly less elaborate hardware design and a more abstract functional design. So whether Weimar actually said this or not, he essentially is creating a mechanism to define the relationship between the cyber and physical aspects of a cyber physical system. And that's pretty neat. That's something that we should probably be taking advantage of. Another part of Weimarian systems theory is something I've come to categorize as computational systems theory. And it's actually a branch back uh, from Weimar's original mathematical theory of systems engineering. And it provides some unique mechanisms that, that Wymore didn't account for within his model-based systems engineering book that are, are pretty powerful that I, I think we can capitalize on. And within the computational systems theory, there's this idea of levels of specification, where at the top level, you have your, your problem space or your boundary uh, that, you're, that you're looking at, followed by a level where you're looking at global functionality and then the component coupling. Now, Weimar didn't actually account for, for this relationship between the, the global and the component coupling. So essentially what it's saying is that you can provide this like vertical uh, specification down to the component level. Another thing that Weimar didn't account for, so Weimar actually only accounted for this morphism right here at this level uh, level, what I'm calling level one here. What one more did not account for was morphisms at this level zero or morphisms down at the component coupling level. And, and these are things that I believe that we, we can actually use within our, our practice and education of, of systems engineering. So taking it back to the context of verification and just and just bringing it back to where I started is how do we actually characterize verification requirements today? Well, I mean, if you look at the COSI Systems Engineering Handbook, essentially what it says is that we define a verification requirement as a, a method that we use. I mean, like a simulation, like a test, like an inspection. And in some cases, yeah, it says the GOSI handbook says that we can a, a define a, a further textual requirement or further specification of the system requirement. And so I agree that we should define some relationship to the system requirements. The other part too, and the other question is how do we actually characterize verification assets relative to the system design today? Do we, what do we do? Is it subject matter expert, which is essentially heuristics? That's kind of consistent with my experience. So I'd like to just for a moment, I mean, if you take these, these four systems right here, 
And, and let's just say you have the global functionality of the, the system as, as this system to the left. How can you actually know that, that these systems are, in fact, more detailed implementations of the system? Or how can you actually know if you say you had to pick one component, how do you know a component may be a valid representation of the system or not? Is it? Well, with morphisms, I believe we can answer that. So if we start thinking in terms of morphisms, we have a mechanism to actually understand that abstraction and elaboration of the systems that we're going to be increasingly relying on. So putting it again back in this, this context is where we have these relationships up here at the what I'm calling the black box level, where we can specify those based on morphisms. We can understand their relationships to one another. And the second being the, the design to the verification. We can use the concepts of a morphism to actually understand that the verification asset is a valid representation of the design or is not. So these are some of the morphisms that, that I'm actually ex exploring right now. And uh, essentially the interface one is, is the, the black box context that I just highlighted in the next slide where the other seven are, are kind of more important to specifications of the, the system itself. And a, a homomorphism is essentially a, an elaboration or abstraction and, and a mechanism to measure that. And an isomorphism is saying that the two systems are essentially the same. So in the example I gave at the beginning of the actual end product to the design, that should be an isomorphism. Endomorphism, and automorphism, those are two that I'm likely going to leave for, for after my gra I graduate, but I wanted to bring them up because they're, they're pretty fascinating within the context of, of some of our modern systems. So into and automorphisms are the idea of systems producing models of themselves. And so where that's kind of interesting, at least from my perspective, is the idea of maybe a safety critical system where the system is producing a model itself or the idea of a learning-based system producing a model of itself. And where that's actually pretty, pretty interesting to me, at least, is that when you're testing a learning-based system, you're effectively causing the system itself to change. So by requiring the learning-based system to produce a model of itself, you can test the model without causing changes in the system. A parameter morphisms and approximate morphisms, I, I think those are some of the, the more practical as well where essentially that's saying that, that we're going to have some type of approximation, or in the case of parameters, at least, it's some parameters may be relevant within a given frame of observation versus others, or versus may not be in another frame of observation. And most of what I've talked about, too, are in terms of exact morphisms, where in reality, we're, they're not necessarily going to be exact. It's, it's something that we need to account for and just say that instead of looking for exact morphisms, maybe we look for the neighborhood of morphisms. And to give you just some, some just quick context, I have, have this example where this is a notional minefield and a deterrent. And one example that I'll say that that is pretty clear that you can have a, a validity and some abstraction is this idea of the, the minefield, this quadrant right here where you have some homogeneity within the, the population. So at the more elaborate level, you can actually define each, each obstacle as an individual model, or you could actually lump them all together as, as one model, and that could be a valid abstraction. Now, when you're looking at the system as a whole in this context, let's just say you, you draw the boundary around this, this green area, that's when things become a little bit less clear. And for example, if, if you just wanted to take either the operator or the UAV and say, ask the question, are these valid abstractions of the system? Maybe, maybe not. But with morphisms, we can actually have, have a way of being able to define that. And I'm getting toward the, the end here. So this is actually verification and, and what is verification? 
So that goes back to requirements, which requirements are there because they're contractual agreements. We, we need some sort of mechanism, one, to define a contractual obligation, and two, to define adherence to the contractual obligation. And that's where a, a verification comes in. And so in the case of a, a verification a, a test that you have for verification or verification activity, you know, the answer may be a binary yes or no result. But ultimately, what we're getting at is we're using verification as a mechanism for to achieve confidence that the design meets the requirements. And so that's why we can actually use Bayesian methods to actually understand uh, how this how these uh, how a verification looks at in terms of shaping our beliefs as to the meeting of the system to its requirements. And ultimately what I'm saying here is that I'm gonna use a Bayesian network and uh, I'm gonna use that to understand the shaping of our, our beliefs as a result of understanding of adherence to of a verification asset to the design. And this is my, my last slide here. And I just wanna talk about some of the, the next steps. So. I'm in the process right now of, of defining a, some use cases, some, some case studies where you have some true positives where the morphisms do hold and other cases where they may not hold. And I'm gonna start collecting this data in, in roughly the, the January time, time frame. And as part of collecting that data, I, I wanna understand how do we actually judge the validity right now of these verification assets to the design? Do we make assumptions? I mean, is it from what I have experienced in, in practice is that a subject matter expert says, yep, it's valid, which is essentially like saying that we're using heuristics. What I'm saying is that if we use morphisms, then we can convert uh, heuristic based art into a science. Now, uh, so the mathematical mechanisms, they, they do exist. But unfortunately, right now, the software mechanisms to actually establish this uh, understanding of these morphic relationships, they don't really exist. So what that means is I'm essentially going to have to limit what I do to some simple examples. But ultimately, what this means is that uh, if, if this is right, and, and I'm right with this, then it's, it's going to be a change in the way that we uh, both educate from a systems engineering perspective and the way we actually characterize our practice. So in practice, rather than saying, I want a simulation or I want a you know, quarter scale physical model that I'm gonna put into a wind tunnel, it's gonna be saying, I want a uh, verification asset that is this category of morphism that is valid within this frame of observation, which is the verification requirement. And that's gonna be the way that we actually verify, verify the systems. And that's increasingly, again, important in, in context of the modern complexity of systems, where no matter what, we're going to have to rely on some abstract representation of the design. And ultimately too, in the, in the fact of using the Bayesian networks, we have the ability to understand uh, the cognitive aspects of, of how we actually determine these today and how should we be determining those. I'd like to leave you this one, one last thing is that, let's just say you take you know, this system, this 4X system, and maybe you know that one of these components and or you could only choose one of these components. Which one would you choose to be a valid representation of the system as a whole? And why? And the answer to that, it, it does matter. And, and I'm not going to tell you the answer because I, I can actually morphically understand how that actually interacts and whether one is a valid representation or not, or maybe both of them are. And and the trick is to really like understand, again, that cognitive aspect of what do we think today without actually knowing the answer. So what I'm saying is just let's, let's think in terms of these morphic relationships. And it provides some theoretical foundations for that advances the state of our, our practice and, and our education. And with that, thank you. Any questions?
Can you can you see the question? There's a question from Beth Welton, Wilson and Paul. So I can read it. Yeah. So I think the, the question is revolving around statistical methods and specifically design of experiments. And so I, it's it, yes, there is absolutely a parallel to design of experiments within this context. And so essentially with design of experiments, you're defining what I would call a specific frame of observation. And in which case there's validity to the parameters that you're using, there's validity to the, the abstraction or the elaboration and whether the morphism actually holds. So yes, that's, that's something that I've, I've thought through. It's, it's not something, or I've thought, I should say, I've, I've thought about. It's not something that I've really explored in too much detail. And partially because from what I've seen, the concept of morphism that I'm exploring is something that's more parallel and complementary to statistical methods and, and design of experiments. So I see it as something that's going to enhance, enhance our, our statistical methods. So I'll ask you a question in person, <clears throat> just because it was it's faster than typing it out. But so your uh, your picture of the silverfish example, it was actually quite interesting because in context of that system function overall, that UAV only has a small set of related functions to the overall operation of the system. And it would seem that envisioning the verification is the only way to, to define what those abstractions are uh, that you would need to then mathematically model. Um, is, am I interpreting that right in terms of your theory here? Yeah, I, I think if I if I understood you correctly, were you saying that you could essentially just pick the UAV and that would be the only part that you need mathematically model? Is that what your question was? No, what I'm saying is it, in the UAV, there are a very limited set of functions it would provide that are relevant to the overall system. And so you would pick only those relevant capabilities um, into the verification of the system, with the, which then can define what those abstractions are. Yeah, so that, that could be one way. And, and so I would define those relevant functions as a specific frame of observation that's relevant within a given context. And so for me, I would define that as the verification requirement that then you could understand how it's relevant to the overall system interactions and characterize the, the abstract verification asset based on, on that, you know, what you call relative functions. It's, it's good food for thought. Um, Beth Wilson actually had a follow-up said, you say you want to explore case studies. Have you looked at the two case studies discussed here, Silverfish and Skyzer? Obviously you, <laughs> you have. <laughs> So I didn't discuss Skyther here, <laughs> but I, I have I have presented it on it this week and, and recently, so multiple times. But I have looked at Skyther. I, I will say that it's it's not clear to me, at least at this moment, how I can leverage Skyther. I am absolutely looking at ways to leverage that since uh, that's part of the research that, that I get paid to do. So I would like to have some synergy there. Uh, the Silverfish model, yeah, if uh, I actually presented two weeks ago at the AI workshop on how to actually do the same thing within the context of uh, silverfish. And so one of the things that, that is interesting to me within the context of silverfish is that essentially what we're saying there is that it's, it's a prob the probabilistic systems. And, and so that's, I'm not just restricting to one type of system like, uh, or system formalism, continuous, discrete. Uh, it's probabilistic. I, from what I've seen, it, it doesn't necessarily matter. There's morphisms that you can hold at levels of specification that we need to understand despite the formalism that's that's actually the system is adhering to. So so yes, I've actually looked at those, those two case studies. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. No other questions. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.